Bonsoir à tous. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's really good of you to come here and to talk about savings at uh, this time in the afternoon with the temperature it is, so well done to all of you. So who benefits from savings? That's a question which we're all here to talk about. The jingle wasn't uh, for a, a detective story, no, it's for our discussion, who uh, benefits from savings. So I am part of a generation who learned about this savings at school and I had to write an essay all about uh, get rich by working and saving. So uh, I have always been interested in savings. Later on I had uh, an exam at my other school where savings opportunities in the world today, that's uh, an, a good exam question, and then there was another one. I went to work in banks after that in 2008 when we had the economic crisis, the subprime crisis and then the Lehman Brothers crisis. And at the time we were all very frightened. I worked at the Credit Agricole. We put some measuring tools to find out whether our savers were, bringing, <coughs> were taking their money out uh, and uh, putting it in a safe, for example. Instead, we saw that, or we see that savings is a question which affects everybody. And then I worked to the World Bank and had a more macro macroeconomic approach, analyzing um, savings around the world. In 2015, we all had this Paris agreements about the Sustainable Development Goals. At the time, we said it would be easy and it will cast a few thousand billions, i.e. a fraction of worldwide savings. All we need to do is reallocate a certain percentage of these savings to solve the climate problem. We see today that we are still concerned. I've written a book called Can Finance Save the World? This is one of the questions we'll be broaching today. It's a light motive, if you like, that we'll be talking about this afternoon. And it takes me to uh, something which Marie is going to be telling you about in a minute. We want to talk about, so at the end of the day, who benefits from savings? Everybody gets an advantage from savings. Those who do save, those who don't, those who manage savings, those who get their savings managed. And it's uh, La Fontaine said we all uh, uh, we're all experts when it, we're talking about uh, savings. So is say are savings uh, useful to the saver or to their heirs, for example, because you're saving for yourself, but also for your heirs, your children? Does it benefit those who borrow? Does it uh, benefit intermediaries? Does it benefit those who are paid taxes? So there's a lot of ways of uh, talking about savings. I'm not going to say it's a golden subject. It's a bit of an easy play on words there. But we do tend to talk about that. So we say that uh, the savings is still a hot topic today. So I can't wrap up without thinking of some big investors. George Soros was asked what is an investment. He said it's speculation that has failed. One can remember, and we'll probably be thinking about this in future weeks, this time it's different. And I have to quote Warren Buffett, who said a lot of things, but I will say two of his things. The number one rule of investment is never to lose money. And second rule is never to forget rule number one. And because we're an ex, Warren Buffett said also when someone is sitting in the shade today is because somebody took the trouble to plant a tree a long time ago. Over to you, Marie. Thank you very much, Bertrand, for that uh, lovely introduction, full of many points for discussion. So together we have uh, with us today a wonderful panel. I'm going to introduce to you Nicola Calcon, who is Deputy Chief Executive Officer, Head of Distribution and Wealth Division at uh, Amundi. Then we've got uh, Anna Di Mazo, Partner and Managing Director of France at Bain and Company. Florence Lustman, you are Chair of France Assure. Bertrand Hombou, Chair of France Invest. And Philippe Setbon is Chair of AFG. Thank you very much for being with us today to talk about a subject which is both technical and political. 
particularly here in France today, as uh, Bertrand pointed out. So, Nicolas Kelkoen, can I talk to you first of all? Perhaps we'll set the scene, i.e., savings in France and Europe is very high, as we've been saying, but it's not being invested where it would be most efficient in our economy for future generations, for example. Is this really the case? And what do we do to correct the situation if it's not the case? Well, thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Let me give you a first um, fragment of a response. Yes, we do have a lot of savings in France in particular, 20% uh, savings rate, which is uh, more or less what we see here in Europe and in the United States. However, do we have too much savings? No, I don't think so. Because there are some households which save a lot, but we know that there are loads of households who do not save anything at all. And so, in truth, if you take savings in France, France isn't really a big saver, on the contrary. So, having said that, I believe that uh, there's a question of how we allocate this uh, savings. Where do we invest it? If we take a look at data about French households, two-thirds of savings is in real estate, purchasing property, their home, and we have a little bit of financial savings, but uh, uh, it's usually for safe bets there, very... Uh, 60% in deposits and life insurance in euros, so there's, there's nothing negative about investing in uh, the deposit accounts or life insurance, nothing negative at all. However, given the rules of liquidity and regulations, that savings naturally is funneled into short-term savings or savings where the rates are uh, not really high enough given the needs that people have in terms of cash flow. So, if we take France, that's what the situation is, and the same thing is more or less uh, around Europe. If we look at the balance of payments, taking a look at Europe, we export savings, i.e. we invest in products uh, of other countries, and we also receive flows to finance our businesses. We purchase American debt, and American pension funds are, uh, hold or own our businesses. So how can we correct that situation? <coughs> I think we'll all have a point of view on that. However, I think that we should start from the client need. He needs or she needs security, etc. They want to be uh, helped to invest in the longer term. And so we are led to talk about tax uh, systems uh, and rules and regulations. We need to have a tax system which is coherent with the risk involved in saving. So. Savings collected by insurance companies, what is that used for? And who decides how it's used? Is it the saver or is it the insurance company? Well, thank you very much for this question. And let me just uh, react to what you've just said. Uh, in a tent across the way, uh, we were opening the, the room for questions, so I'm gonna ask you a question. We insurance companies, we've got 2,300 billion euros of savings, i.e. investments. You have entrusted that money to us. So in your opinion, what is the percentage of shares in that huge amount of money? And I'm sure you're gonna get it wrong. You might not get it wrong. Perhaps I should ask 5% uh, someone's saying? Who's got a better bid than that? Mm, almost 10, any more suggestions? Don't be shy. Well, I'm not going to wait any longer. The answer is 23%. And if there's one thing, one take home message today, I want it to be this one. Because no one has ever written that down. Because out of the 2,300 billion, 23% are in shares. 34% bonds, 6% in uh, corporate real estate. So that means 63% is invested in 
businesses. 24% in sovereign debt. We can't say that it doesn't finance the economy because it does finance public policy. However, I do not understand why people are always saying that, uh, that we're exactly like a regulated, uh, say, VINGS. But it's not the case. It's the insurance companies that are regulated. So we fund businesses mainly, and we fund the French economy and the European economy. And I would like to um, thwart uh, preconception. When we talk about France saying we don't uh, fund uh, the economy enough, that's untrue. And people say we're not funding France and Europe enough. 80% of the insurance company's investments, and my asset manager friends will confirm this, they are invested in France and Europe. It's much less than the pension funds. If you look at the European pension funds, it's under two thirds, which is which are invested in the eurozone. So, if there's a take-home message here, it is: if you want to fund uh, your economy, businesses, growth, the eurozone, France and Europe, well, you have to invest in life insurance. And I could say the same thing with figures for Europe from insurance companies. It's an important message. Your second question was who decides? Well, they're both of them. That's the magic of life insurance. We are obliged to give advice. And I'm thrilled that we have that obligation. What do the French people ask us? 80% of us want, 80% of them want um, security and easy access to their money. And so you really have to satisfy people's needs. Don't try and be cleverer than they are. However, we've been very clever because we've invented some products such as the Euro Fund, which you've already mentioned. But this Euro Fund is so global, international, that you can uh, have uh, risky investments, investments which are not on the stock exchange, and all kinds of other things in it. And the magic thing about it is that at the end of the day, you've got a product which is not risky at the end because you've got a certain amount of guaranteed capital in the euro fund so that satisfies the client if they want a bit more risk then they'll take another product and 40% uh, of these more risky elements so the uh, French are starting to take a little bit of risk and all of those who wish to start to save We've got this Euro fund, which can include, because it's such a universal thing, and because it pulls everything, it can include very risky investments, and that is why insurance companies are regulated, because they are the ones that carry that involvement risk. They are the ones who take the risk to say, I'm going to diversify my investments so that I can go and get better yield, but at the end of the day, I know that my commitment to my client is to give him or her back that capital which is guaranteed. Have you got that about your preconceptions there? Okay, when we were preparing this round table, you said that the saver has to be satisfied with their savings. So, we're talking about investing in the real economy. Are people doing that? Well, let me answer with a question. Did you, do you know how much individual savings we have in the funding of uh, the industry which I represent? Zero, five, ten percent, twenty-two, you said twenty-three earlier? Well, we, uh, private equity, we're talking about here, we are at five percent. I would just like to come back shortly about why and how we can enhance everything. We have a class of assets which has grown recently. We fund innovation, SMEs, very small industries. So we have 50 billion euros which are invested in the French economy. We have traditionally, since this, uh, met this profession has been around, i.e. 40 years, we've got insurance companies, bankers, and thanks to you, because you are our clients, without you, we would not be able to fund our uh, professions and the businesses, so let's never forget that. And then, for a certain amount of time now, increasingly, we have family offices, we've got entrepreneurs who, uh, have, who are investing in our businesses, and more recently, we've seen individual savers. 
thanks to life insurance and uh, pension schemes, etc. But there's a kind of a tiny proportion when you compare it uh, with the rest. However, why is this? I think it's we've all come to the same conclusion. It real assets which are not listed, it's, it's kind of light is away from individual savings, so it's normal. And it's a question of relationship with risk. In France, in particular, people are rather reserved about risk. And there's also a question of distribution, explaining what this class of assets is. It's, it's a bit unique. So I think that we are on the at the dawn of a huge change. I think we are heading towards progressive change. Yes, it'll all happen very slowly. There are some things which are going through here in France, but progressive towards a lot more individual saving. This is a need, of course, for the life of our businesses. I think we've never been at such an important crossroads before in terms of energy, intelligence, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, data, everything. We need debt, but we also need uh, uh, capital, treasury, to, uh, capital to be able to do that. I think in a few years' time, uh, if we've got a lot of savings which has not been invested, we're going to need savings to fund the transition. Third point, uh, we're showing that our professions, my job, etc., it is a business that is very high performing and it gives you a lot of cash flow. And that's important as well. So we're uh, about to see these huge changes occur. I'm sure later on we'll talk about how the regulations are changing and that will uh, foster this evolution. I just want to come back to that first question. There are some very big uh, capital investors who are very well known. They're, they're French, but then around the world. They think in the coming years, 20% of their resources will come from individual savers. So I think this is, a, this is adding a new twist to the story. So let's talk about how the legal framework has evolved. Let's turn to you. So how does one go about um, changing the legal framework to, uh, to accommodate uh, these changes uh, and all climate change and all the other transitions we're going through. So how do you get the regulations to evolve? Hello. So AFG, that's who I work for, uh, we represent the companies that manage assets. Uh, these, we work with insurance companies, uh, savers, banks, etc. So we are in constant touch with the French regulator and uh, others in Europe. Regulations are changing, we can talk about that, but I just want to make a quick comment here. The regulatory framework is absolutely fundamental. We need a regulatory framework, particularly in these professions where there are regulations. This framework, if I can draw a parallel with a sporting competition, for example, we've got the, you've got the uh, outlines of the pitch, you've got the rules of the game, but that's not enough to win. The rules aren't going to help you to score goals. What I'm trying to say is that let's not expect that the rules are going to make investments uh, efficacious. They are simply the means to an end. They, they don't take you across the finish line. So we, can, we want to get regulations to change. Bertrand uh, mentioned this. We all need regulators. They work with us on these changes, the public authorities also, because there are public uh, policies which are translated into regulations. We need to work in a dynamic manner. And I'm thinking here of two major challenges, to be very, very concrete about this. We're talking about transition energy, digital, all of the other transitions. European regulation today gives us a snapshot. It gives us a framework. It does not define what a transition is. So I am absolutely convinced that if we were to ask everyone here, including us up here on the stage, what is your definition of a transition, we would have as many definitions as we have people in the room. 
So we want to work on defining the word definition, uh, transition, and uh, how we're going to make that transition. So above and beyond the regulatory framework, which is important because it, it gets us all off in the same direction, because to speed up transitions, if we've all got different uh, definitions, well, I'll tell you all, our efforts will be scattered all over the place, and our savings, your savings, will be uh, scattered to ineffective vectors because they correspond just to a snapshot. It's the easiest thing in the world today to, to practice exclusion. That's the easiest thing in the world, but that's not what we're supposed to be doing. We need to be transforming industrial fabric, the production fabric in France, Europe, and elsewhere, if possible. The second example is with reference to what you mentioned, Bertrand, the importance of uh, uh, regulations, uh, pushing things forward, driving things forward, so that we can democratize those assets which are not uh, listed. And it's important. It has to be shepherded along. It's not spontaneous. The, the uh, stakes are high, stakes in terms of cash flow and stability for the sailors, who we all are, individually speaking. Savings is like uh, an aggregate of national accounting. We, uh, we can look at it like that, but in fact, it's the sum total of all our individual savings. That's how we have to look at it. And that is why Nicola was talking about clients and, serve, and savings at the service of the client. So the regulations must evolve in that particular direction. So Ada Di Mazzo, a question for you. And it's, can one educate people about saving? Can you teach savers how to save? Can you heighten their awareness about saving? I'm absolutely convinced this is a key question. Earlier on, we were talking about energy transitions, digital transition. We're talking about investment, uh, taxonomy. The challenge of uh, teaching um, savers is absolutely key because if we want to earmark savings for these different things to fund uh, socially crucial elements, well, we need to uh, teach on three different things. First of all, we have to make the offers uh, understand, comprehensible. When I mentioned earmarking savings for the energy transition, only 10% of savers have heard about any offerings which would correspond to that. So you can see what the biggest challenge is. Then, even when you've got half of your clients, you have to make sure they're understanding what the, what the offers are. Half of the clients who are saving here in France would like to invest in, in uh, vehicles for environmental transition, but, but there's only a fraction of those people actually purchasing those products. So they need to understand the product, the nature of the product, and uh, some products are going to be a bit more risky. So it needs education. And in the English-speaking world, this is uh, much more developed. And to a lesser degree, once you understand where your savings are going, you need to know how it's going to perform, who's going to use it, and is it going to be used by the people we're hoping is going to be used it. So that's all part of the teaching process as well. We have to make sure people understand uh, all of this. The good news is that, yes, the stakes are in terms of human beings, and in the savings distribution networks, it's the key factor, i.e. the human being, your advisor, the advisor's ability to listen to what you want, to advise you, to guide you towards the, the right product, and most savers would like to have an advisor who advises them. The second thing is, each time they see their advisor, nine times out of ten, they're very, very happy. The satisfaction level in the distribution network has never been so high in France, not for 10 years. So it's optimistic, we, but we need to simplify, we need to explain, and, but the, the good news is that it all boils down to the human being and we can, we can invest in that. So Florence, is, are the French averse to risk? 
And can you tell us a little bit about risk linked to transition? Well, first of all, I'm going to talk about transition because here we're talking about finance and funding, but uh, an insurance company is the one who covers the risk and there can be consequences to climate risk. We work alongside by you, those uh, people who are insured by us for decades now. They've been suffering the consequences of weather events. They're said to be extraordinary, but they're becoming more frequent. We have forecast over the next 30 years, the cost of weather events will double. Uh, drought, for example, could triple in the next 30 years. And so people are becoming very aware of this because every time uh, there's a flood or there's a cyclone, as we've seen in the, in the uh, hinterland behind Nice quite recently, those things are impossible to predict. And the media report about them a lot. So the French are now fully aware there are surveys which confirm this. Over 80% of the population has understood that uh, climate risks are going to increase what with climate change. Now, I agree with what has just been said about educating people about risk. When you ask people, are you prepared? Have you got any information? Have you gone to look on the website of France Assureur? Because we give you lots of uh, information about what action you must take if there's a risk of flood. And do you know what your local risks are? And if you're in the mountain or if you're by the coast? or if you uh, live in a flood zone near to a forest which might go up in flames, there are only half of the people who we question who've taken the bother to find out what the principal local risk is for them. So there's a huge, there's huge room for manoeuvre here in how we can educate people, educate them about risks climate risk and now I think there's a national uh, day devoted to resilience it's the 13th of October and we want to make sure that this uh, day is unrolled on a local event so that pe private people but also businesses and uh, local councils we want them all to get to grips with the most likely risks in their zone because whenever there is a huge event very sadly uh, behavior when people are stressed they do uh, inappropriate things for example in a flood people will get into their car to drive to the school to collect their children but their roads are, are flooded and and things and if uh, someone goes down into their cellar where the cellar is already flooded so I agree with you yes we it's a question of reinsurance somehow we have a lot of innovation a lot of new technologies which we insurance companies are funding to adapt our buildings and our behavior to global warming. But there are always human beings in the link, in the loop. And we human beings, we all need to learn more about how we should behave with increased climate risks. And I'd just like to round off by saying that for savings, yes. And I was su surprised to hear that 60% do see there um, advisors. I think they simply need to turn up on the doorstep of the bank and, and you, they will be shown into a, an advisor's office. But 70% of the life insurance contracts have a, 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 a month, uh, amount under 70,000 euros. So you will have advice, uh, an advisor who will be able to guide you in the right direction. And a lot of people say they need to give some meaning to their savings. It's beyond the transitions. They are looking for meaning, and we answer that because over 90% of investments with insurance companies are subject to different uh, uh, ESG criteria. And so, when you've got over 5,000 euros to in invest, you're better off investing in a guaranteed product. But if someone's got more to invest, they can put some of their savings in a euro fund and there's a whole range of uh, accounts that uh, will be useful. Some focus on biodiversity, some focus on uh, climate equilibrium, etc. So I'm slightly surprised by your figure of 100% because to me it seems that most advisors, certainly in the insurance and banking sectors, they are going to give advice to any saver who comes along. So they want to have advice, that means they're getting it, they can't do without savings.
Nicolas Galli. In light of everything that we have said, can we have an influence on savings flows? I think so, yes with different uh, elements and different types of answers that could be combined with that. First of all, this is our responsibility in every savings industry sector that we represent, namely to design straightforward products that can be understandable, that could be not costly, cost effective with advisors. The advisory could uh, act, advisory services can take the form and shape of uh, various uh, uh, various kinds. We have to make people aware. We have to make savers aware that when they have a long-term horizon, it would be meaningful to take more risks if it's done in a diversified way, reasonable way. Obviously, we should have a tax and regulatory framework that is appropriate. I like the comparison with uh, uh, the uh, soccer pitch uh, framework uh, 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 parallel. I think it's very good. It needs to favor, we need to favor more risky but longer term products that would benefit the customer. When we use the weapon of taxation, it can be legitimate to be uh, conditioned if we uh, require important savings in Europe to have uh, that, that those benefits. That's the case, actually. It's maybe less the case in other countries in, the, in Europe. But another element that could have an influence and that could help us gear the needs that we might have in France, in Europe, in other countries, we need financial industry stakeholders in France and Europe that are strong, robust, that are competitive. And that uh, can be found when we see the proportion of assets savings geared towards European assets when they're managed by European managers, it's stronger, it's more robust than when it is managed by American stakeholders, and some of them are actually present in our countries. Bertrand Robot, we are going to look ahead. Maybe they are in the room. We are going to look ahead and, and, and uh, look beyond our borders. So what, what do we see in terms of difference between the US and ourselves? And can we imagine an, an, a European ecosystem that could be compared to that uh, of the US? Just to give you a few figures, I told you earlier that the individual savings in private equity would be 5%. In the US, it's 50 The ratio uh, related to the GDP between US and uh, uh, Europe, it's 2.5% uh, plus. Well, we can give, we can shed light on the reasons for this. Should we go towards this direction? I don't think so. Each country has its own culture. Will we go into that direction? I don't think so. Not overnight, anyway. And we should look into the characteristics. We have savings culture, uh, investment culture, and the Americans are not a single model. It's just interesting to see the evolution, the developments that took place there. How can we change? We can see, say, OK, we're convinced that change is about to uh, happen, but how? We could say, OK, tomorrow it's going to be 10% or more in terms of midterm goals. I'm talking about private equity once more. I'm talking about my own industry sector. We talked about the regulatory framework. I would like to be more precise. In France, we have the PACT law, the green industry law, and the decree, the implementing, the implementing decree was just enacted earlier on, two days ago, if I'm not mistaken, which is good, because it will help to get closer to individual savings, and it will make it, it will integrate it in the culture. What we should, the takeaway message, in my opinion, if there's one, that's the one. We have the opportunity today, as an individual saver, with 1,000 euros, to have access to a fund in which there will be a lot of family offices and a lot of institutionals, thanks to life insurance and to retirement fund. Uh, that means that there's an alignment of interest, that what we're looking for, for big institutionals and big 
multi f or family offices. It will be the same as for private individuals. Everybody in the end will be happy. It may be straightforward, but the, invest, the, peop, the person investing must be happy and satisfied with the yield, with the investment. We have a few obligations, however. You talked about educational uh, obligation. Of course, this is very significant because not everyone is acquainted with uh, private equity investment. When you have 5,000 euros to, to invest, don't go towards private equity. That will be a first thing to say. We have to understand what this class of assets is. They are very uh, wonderful things. We follow some companies' paths that are tremendous. This is what makes gives me a thrill, actually. Uh, and we can see it in the investment. But we need time. Cash flow is more complicated, so we need to understand that it may be more difficult to have available assets. And with France Invest, we have a, a training school where we teach distributors what our trade is all about, what the characteristics are, what are the, 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 the drawbacks, and what are also the benefits. I would like to talk about the cost of distribution, because not everything is free where there's management uh, fees, of course, that is paid out by funds, by everyone, family offices, institutionals, but also the individual savers. And if the individual saver has access to it, it is because there's a distribution cost. We hear a little bit of everything and anything, really. They say it's going to be, it's going to cost twice as much as it cost before. It's not true. We made some surveys about the cost, and we managed to find 0 0.5, 0 0.8 of the annual costs in our funds. But we need to actually make collective efforts to try to stronghold everything. We need to make sure that these individual savings is satisfied. And we need to give good education and to make sure that the costs do not ramp up so that we can do the investment. That's really what is important. That's where the rubber hits the road. And this is what we have to respect. We have to respect this roadmap that is really important. Philippe Sebo, I see you react to what has been said by Bertrand Rimbaud, especially on the American side. I would like to say to you, should we have a specific European system, a better European organization, a specific European system? Well, we already have it. I'm talking as president of ANG. I'm also in charge of a, a significant management company whose uh, uh, significant portion of turnover comes from the US. We also have a European component. That means that regulation dictates most uh, all of our actions. What do you mean by European approach? It may not be the same. OK, OK, if you want. But you know, the facts are there. The proof is in the pudding. So, one day, we should look and compare in an objective way the efficiency of the two models. I'm not saying that one is better than the other, but maybe we should have some objectivity in the way in which we see the impact of each system. Should we go forward with European specific features? Yes, we have a specific approach. We should fine tune it. We should delve into it, but, but, with, I would like to give you a few elements that feed our discussions with the European authorities and regulators, which are the following. In Europe, we were talking about security, prices, different components, adjustment, obviously. Now, for 40 years now or more in Europe, any regulatory development, it may be the case in this industry, but in any other industry as well, they, their aim is to protect the consumer. So we have to understand how can we educate the consumers? How can we help them make the right decisions that are suitable for their profile, for their circumstances? And we have to protect the consumer at all cost. The consumer whom we're talking about and whom we want to protect at all cost 
is also a salaried employee, an entrepreneur, a retiree, or someone uh, who's a member of the working population. So this consumer has all interest for us to work on the competitiveness of industry, and this is why we need to set up a virtuous circle for, in this direction. So regulation, we're working on it consistently in a vibrant way, but we should not lose the idea of having a competitive world for such companies. Otherwise, the, consum the consumer will continue to consume things from outside because performance, high yield, is elsewhere. It's not in Europe anymore. So, Alain Marzo, before giving the floor to the audience, because of course we're going to have a Q&A, I would like to speak with you briefly on what Bertrand has just said in the introduction about future generations. Should they take on board the future generations when we're talking about savings? I like your question very much. Because when we talk about savings, it seems very technical. But it's a matter, it's an issue which is important for the society at large. So, we should enter uh, into a collected but also a committed savings era. It is important for me. When you see the savings ratio of people under 30 year olds, it's 8%. But the savings ratio for people over 70, it's 25%. And actually, that's where there is a contradiction in our society. Savings should be the common denominator between the two generations, because otherwise we can't have new generations that cannot allow themselves to uh, become entrepreneurs, to create an, uh, new companies. This is why the industry has a lot at stake, because they, savings needs to have a purpose. It needs to be earmarked to concrete projects. We have a lot of things at stake, the infrastructures, um, reindustrialization, entrepreneurship, everything is at stake. Should it, should it lie only in the hands of the financial industry? No, it should be in the hands of everyone. This is where the ecosystem needs to ch change everywhere and work in hand, to hand in hand with all the uh, stakeholders. Question, sir, you have the floor. Hello, Eisenberg, OSS Ventures. In 93, I was the general rapporteur of this uh, commission of Dissange entrepreneurs to set up the program for the presidential elections that brought Chirac to become a president. We said so many things. I co-signed this report with Mr. Perrault from BNP, director of BNP, and later on he was the director of BNP Paribas. And we said we should gear savings towards productive activities, companies, and there are two things to, to do, life insurance, and there are things that actually surprise me, I have to say, and retirement funds, second thing. I was interviewed two months ago by Trésor before the dissolution, and I told them this, exactly this, and they said, no, political decision makers are not ready. Management industry should not go into that direction, and it is necessary if we want to exist as European, as French company managers, we need to create retirement funds. So how do we get that? How do we reach that point? Thierry Hulot from L'Entreprise des Médicaments Groupe Merck in the pharmacy world. It is suggested to take all the Frenchman's savings to reimburse the debts. What is your opinion about this? We should not talk about elections and electoral topics. That's what we were told. Another question. Maybe you could answer to these two questions before having a second round. On the magic of retirement funds, on pension funds, 
you know there were a lot of uh, discussions with carpet with uh, market unions capital market do you know what capital market union is that's the union of uh, capital markets that's a European project a, a European reflection that is starting again and we were thinking of having a union of capital markets in Europe and one of the reflections that went out is we do not fund companies in our, the real world with our savings. And so we looked for figures. And this is why I can give you the percentage on equity, even though uh, we've published it for decades now. What struck me, what surprised me, is there are two subjects. We should fund real economy, but also we should fund it in Europe. And I was quite surprised to see that in countries where there are pension funds, I'm talking about uh, the Netherlands or the Nordic countries, where the, the leak of savings towards uh, the US, when we look at the figures, it's because of the pension funds. But also, as you said, because of stakeholders that are American, management companies that are American, and I think that our as French asset managers know the French market, so they have priority. They are better to um, invest in French companies. But when we have American asset managers talking about how to manage assets in Europe, they talk about the market that they know best. And actually, it's the American market, obviously. Two, three. Uh, elements. We carried out a recent survey in, in May. It was published in June in, with ING about allocation, allocation of assets carried out by different management companies. And this is actually demonstrated and shown in our publication. So I would invite you to check, check this website out. It will be actually updated very soon in September. And you can check it out on our website. This allocation, which would favor French companies and American companies, that's one thing. Secondly, I wanted to go back to your pension fund input. But anyway, we have worked upstream of the PAC law, and this had an impact on the PAC law. I'm uh, looking at our AFG uh, friends. In 96, we worked on pillar three of uh, the law. We're not talking about pension funds, but rather retirement scheme funds. And uh, I did take note of your question. When we talk about savings aggregate, that is some of individual savings. That's not a national savings. That's not national savings. So we, what we wanted to do is to look into the duration of investment as suitable for each need. We have short-term needs, mid-term, and long-term needs, depending on our life projects. And the savings products are tailored to those needs. They are actually offered by insurance companies, and they were quite successful. And I would urge you to check the products out, because they're very suitable. We are working hard to give a lot of offer, a wide range of products for any kind of uh, type of savings. I don't know if pension funds are the solution, but we need to have long-term solutions. Savings exist, of course. In our trade, there is something that is important, which is that we need to have a good intermediary saleability. We need to have availability of cash because people cannot be committed for too long a period of time. And if the industry manages to facilitate secondary transactions, to have more fluidity, to make it easier to sell products and to have the available cash, then we will open wide the door of such assets and to the companies that it addresses. There's a lot at stake, and it's important for an individual, a family. They cannot commit for a period that is too long. And there are insurance companies that cover these, that hedge these products behind that. And they have a lot in place. 
So we're fully aware of that and the current period of time, the current circumstances with rates that are higher, with less available cash. The liquidity is important. It was found too easily uh, uh, over the last years, and we now have to have a, a more structuring approach because this is an important challenge ahead of us. Thank you. And I would like to say that nobody thinks that it's uh, uh, that nobody thinks that uh, saving is is for dummies. Uh, are there any other questions? Bertrand has written down everything during our debate. And so now we're going to wrap up and you're going to give us the gifs. Uh, you didn't save anything from us, right? Yeah, that's easy. No pun intended. So. It was hard for us to gather at such high temperatures to talk about a difficult, daunting subject. In a way, if I could be mischievous to wrap up, this subject would rehabilitate the expression at the same time. Because at the same time, it's a technical subject, as you have seen, but it's also a sensitive subject. We combine in our answers, our individual reasoning. We say, what does it mean for us? But that, what does it mean for the world as well? We mix the micro and the macro economics. We talk about supply and demand, and we can't take them apart. Nicolas has said rightfully that we talk about private and public savings. They're not non-communicating. We talk about solvency and illiquidity. We talk about short and long-term horizons. And we go back to the important question that I had to address in 1901. That's the balance between savings and investment. We talk about institutions and individuals. And we hope that the interests will converge, which is not easy. We talked about thousands of euros on the one side and thousands of billions of euros on the other side. Each of us, we are a saver, a consumer, a salaried employee, an entrepreneur, a retiree. So we have to find meaning in all of this. That's the first point that remains a complicated subject that is important to all of us. Nobody has no idea because we're all concerned individually. Secondly, we've talked about savings and figures. We've been given some f figures that are important, and I will repeat it. 23% of equity for insurance companies and 23% for investment in real economy, 5% in private equity, 50% in the US, but we are on the road to 20, 25%. Thirdly, we haven't talked about figures only, and that's a good thing. We've talked about education, and we wondered what about human beings? You've talked about being human. That's not a bad word. And I thought it was very nice because we haven't talked about artificial intelligence. I thought it was about to be uh, mentioned, but we talked about real full-fledged human beings that would provide advisory services. It remains at the heart of human beings. The question was asked several times, and it is essential. It's important to remind ourselves that saving is not a matter of product, of regulation, not only a matter of taxation, not only a matter uh, that it's not uh, that we uh, have rules. We need a team. We need enthusiasm. And all this human, these human components are often neglected. And we should talk about it. And I'm glad we drifted towards that subject. It's not a disconnected debate, because we are affected by everything that would impact the economy for obvious reasons, because public economy would affect uh, savings. You talked about political circumstances. They affect also uh, our savings. The US would also affect uh, savings. The American debt, obviously, when I'm talking about the US, I'm talking the American debt. That everything is actually embedded. And this is a subject, as said, that connects the worlds, all universals. And you will see in the proposal made by the SEP, there's one regarding that subject, which is important, on how can we secure with national and European guarantees a more risky 
savings. And it's my privilege to wrap up with a takeaway message in 20 seconds to go with a more personal note. I'm not surprised. You will not be surprised by what I'm going to say. We've had a reasoning that is very f uh, geared toward France and Europe. And this is the way in which we operate nowadays. We thought about France, France towards Europe, France towards the US. We never thought about uh, what I'm going to say. We never wondered about the impact, and we never wondered about the rest of the world. I always go back to that question that I found really, really uh, daunting, the balance, of in, uh, the balance between savings and investment should be analyzed at the scale of France, the Europe, the world, the rest of the planet, the whole planet. It is time to push back the horizons in our reflection on savings, and we should overcome these borders, and we should think about saving that is at the scale of the planet as a whole. Otherwise, we will not reshape our planet and things will go south and it will be the same for the rest of the world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to the rest of the round table and for all of those that have followed it and listened to it. Thank you.